A man of his very own extraordinary invention, Samuel Stewart lived decades before the 1969 Stonewall Rebellion, yet his sexual identity was never in question. Sex was central to his life, and he had lots of it. This is the stud file. It's Sam's lifelong record of all of the people that he had sex with in the course of his life. Um, there's almost 900 cards in here, and it's very carefully cross-referenced and indexed, written in code, pull it open. Sam was trained as a librarian at Ohio State University. With each of these cards, he has the name of the person, the activities they engaged in, the dates they engaged in them, penile dimensions. So it's a very detailed and often quite humorous set of cards. Author Justin Spring chronicles the life of Samuel Stewart, professor, tattoo artist, and sexual renegade in his book, Secret Historian. A Secret Historian is a biography about a man very few people have heard about, and in that way it's sort of a unique biography. So I was out at a, a, a bookstore called A Different Light. There I found, on the shelves, just sitting there, this series of novels by a person called Phil Andros. I recognized immediately that I was in the hands of a storyteller who just happened to write stories about men having sex with other men. I took them home, I collected them, I shared them with people, and they all agree that these were extraordinary tales, but we didn't know who Phil Andros was. Years later, I came across this man, Sam Stewart, who was also friends with Gertrude Stein and Thornton Wilder and Alice Toklas and lived a literary life. Then it turned out he ran a tattoo parlor. That's strange. And then reading and reading, I finally realized this was Phil Andros. This man was the same person. I began trying to figure out everything I possibly could about this man. It took me a couple of years, but I finally found the man who was the executor of the Sam Stewart estate, and it turned out that he had just boxed up everything after ten Sam died. Years, he invited me to come out and look through it, and when I got there, I realized I'd hit the jackpot. <laughs> you know, just this incredible, it was sort of like a Alibaba's cave of 1930s, 40s, and 50s sexuality. Born Samuel Morris Stewart in Woodsfield, Ohio in 1909, he had modest, small-town beginnings. I think Sam, as a young man, was hurt very badly. He was left by his father to grow up with three spinster aunts in a boarding house in Ohio. His mother died when he was very young. And I think he suffered quite a bit of rejection at the hands of his father. And because of his sexual nature, which expressed itself really pretty early in childhood, uh, he always had a sense of himself as an outsider. An outsider, but no wallflower. Sam had his first sexual experience with another boy he described as, quote, a big guy, a football player. Two minutes later, it was over. Apparently not so with silent film star Rudolph Valentino. Simply seeking an autograph, Sam got so much more. He was all of 17. Here's a photograph of the reliquary that Sam put together um, of the film star Rudolph Valentino's pubic hair. It says ex corporis Valentino, and uh, Sam put the little bit of pubic hair that he'd retained from his encounter with Valentino into a monstrance, and he kept this little object at his bedside for most of his life. Sam was a literary man from the very earliest. His poetry collection and his first novel were well received. He was going to go on and become a novelist, like so many of his literary heroes. He was also working and living as a university professor, teaching English literature. And he got sidetracked, uh, first by alcoholism. And then after he was able to get sober, his sex life kind of blossomed and became very central to his life in a way that also sidetracked his literary ventures. Sam collected a lot of um, leather and uh, disciplinary devices. Sam was very interested in the ways in which pleasure and pain could be combined for a heightened sexual experience. Here's a writing crop, a uh, police billy club, Sam was interested in men in uniform. He always had a soft spot in his heart for policemen. Sam was a bit kinky sexually, and he also had a great sense of humor. So here's an example of one of his uh, sex toys. Letters are Phi, Beta, and Kappa. Sam was actually a member of the National Honor Society, a Phi, Beta, Kappa uh, key holder. And so uh, he used a Phi, Beta, Kappa paddle in his banking escapades. Sam would encounter several luminaries through the years. One of his warmest friends and mentors was famed writer Gertrude Stein and her lifelong companion Alice Toklas. It was Stein who introduced Stewart to novelist and playwright Thornton Wilder. Their sexual liaison lasted 10 years. 
In late 1949, Sam met pioneering sex researcher Alfred Kinsey and became an unofficial collaborator. Stewart's highly detailed documentation of his sexual experiences underscored and supported Kinsey's controversial findings about men having sex with other men. So a lot of Sam's literary talent was poured into diaries that were meant expressly for Kinsey. And Sam's diaries are amazing. They're over a thousand pages typewritten of his sexual adventures, experiences, his thoughts about his sexuality, and really turns it into something more like a novel. But Sam was an unbelievably truthful man in these diaries and journals um, because he felt like he was creating a testament not only for himself, but for Kinsey and for sex researchers of the future, for people who really wanted to know what was going on in society. By the early 1950s, Sam had transformed his life. He chose what was then a socially objectionable profession with a clientele limited to hustlers, sailors, bikers, and street thugs. For Sam, it presented a perfect medley of sexual prospects. Sam Stewart became Phil Sparrow, tattoo artist. There was a creative element in him that was just very powerful and very exciting to be around because he created these wonderful things. When he really made that break and became a tattoo artist and began doing his illustrations and decorating his apartment in this outlandish way, it was as if his entire life became this artwork and even if he couldn't share that artwork with anybody, he would live in the center of it. It, it became a kind of private world. In 1966, one young man entered Sam's private world in Oakland, California, where Sam had a tattoo parlor. He would become one of the most commercially successful tattoo artists in the United States. His name? Don Hardy, later known as Ed Hardy. He knew Sam Stewart as Phil Sparrow. Of course, impressed me with Sam. The entire setup of the shop, the first time I saw it, this guy is coming from somewhere different. It was much more like an art studio. It had classical music playing. And all the flash was hand-painted. It was obviously created you know, by Just hand for the, for the shop, which was kind of unique in those days. In those days, tattooing was so underground. It was such a closed shop. I did my first probably five or six tattoos in his shop under his tutelage on, on art school friends and put the first one on myself, as was traditional, with him looking over my shoulders. OK, so Don, here's um, some of what I came across when I found the Stewart Archive. This one always cracks me up because it looks like one of those peasant blouses that were popular in the 1930s, yeah, right, yeah, you know, yeah. like for gals, yeah. right? And here's just, your motorcycle guy, yeah. tough tattoos with the motorcycle boots and yeah. the jeans. Typical tattoos, the panther crawling back, black panther, panther head, and Stinky the skunk. I mean, all these things are so iconic for that era. Sam and hated it, Stinky. He just, because he had to put on so many of them. Oh, yeah, all of us, it became just this thing, and you're like, not another one. Yet. And of course, but it paid the rent. So Sam would be laughing from wherever he is about the fact that tattooing, which he saw as really a dying folk art, you know, and his interest, of course, was largely sociological, anthropological, sexual, and uh, as well as artistic. Now, the revival, even of interest in those classic, corny sort of Americana designs is huge. You see young people walking around, they look like they were tattooed in like 1940, all the images on them. And the classic, the chest eagle, which has remained a classic. And here's one of the sweetest images ever. Sam made this when he made his change over from being a professor to a tattoo artist. He opened his tattoo parlor and he sent greetings from Phil Sparrow to all his friends with the a reindeer putting a Merry Christmas tattoo on Santa Claus. It's great with the, Santa's beard, you know. Draped in the looped, antlers. Yeah, draped over the antlers, <laughs> like moving the beard out of the way so you can tattoo the chest, you know. And of course, Sam being Sam, the big sexy boots are part of Santa's uh, sure. uh, Santa f fashion statement. Right? Highly polished, yeah. <laughs> and there was a whole history of generations, two or three generations of gay men who we knew that they existed, but we didn't have any day-to-day -day awareness of what their life was like. Quite apart from the sensational nature of Sam's life, for me to uh, reconstruct that life in painstaking detail was also to reconstruct what it was like to be a gay person in 1925, 1935, 1945, 1955, 1965. Samuel Stewart died in obscurity on New Year's Eve in 1993. He was 84. The 2010 National Book Awards. In November of 2010, Justin was honored with a National Book Award nomination. 